some people uh, looking into the crystal ball considered Martin Amidou's uh, resignation, the effect of it, the massiveness of it, the thunderbolt of it, as the first reaction to J.J. Rawlings' passing. That everyone thinks that given the relationship between J.J. Rawlings, President Akufuado, and Martin Benskaiza Alamisi Amidou, if Mr. Rawlings was alive, maybe the outcome would have been different. Some people see it as the first reaction to JJ's death. On that note, we move into our studios up there, and our reaction is to pay tribute and eulogize Flight Lieutenant Rawlings. Here it is. A big tree has fallen. Whether it is a neem tree or is an olive tree, it is yet a big tree, and it has fallen. The tree is in the form of a man. J.J. Rollins has passed to eternity. We mourn and we discuss. But for who he was and what he became, we cannot but analyze his legacy. A legacy that transcends at least three or four generations of many Ghanaian families. For most families, grandma will know and would have had an experience of JJ, the leader of the revolution. Mummy or daddy will know JJ of the PNDC and the first president of the Fourth Republic. And the granddaughters and grandsons will certainly know about JJ, the former president and the NDC founder. Not many will punctuate the history of eternal Ghana like JJ has. Even at 73, JJ is gone too soon. But how did he start? It was here, during the rainy season of 1979. Ghanaians had longed and fought for constitutional rule for over 10 years since 1969. And now democracy appeared in the horizon. Politics of the ballot box was returning to Ghana again. But J.J. Rawlins, the young army officer, had other ideas. He believed the excesses of the SMC-1 and SMC-2 should be punished and should be accounted for. In this context, he was aligned with many, many silent Ghanaians. They all wanted some form of punishment to be meted out against the alleged profligacy and the gross indiscipline of the Achampo and Akufu era. And so on the morning of May 15th, when JJ occasioned the uprising, he was doing it for many Ghanaians. And JJ Rollins had the courage to stand the trial after the uprising had failed, a trial of mutiny against the Ghana Armed Forces. His wife, Nana Kunedu Ajiman Rollins, found lawyers to represent JJ. So I took my car and I drove to Nagon and I went to look for Chachu. And then I, I told him what I, I wanted. Um, and then he said, you know, we need a senior lawyer to lead us. Mm -hmm. So we drove all the way to Adebraka. Mm -hmm. He went up, spoke to him. Then he came back and he said, well, the guy wants to see you now. He's interested, so let's go. And when I went, it was a Duma boss man. So the lawyers attended the trial with him. He lost the case. He couldn't defend himself against the accusation of mutiny and treason but his speech won the court of public opinion on the day set for his sentencing june 4th 1979 jj was instead released and thrust straight into leadership via the platform of the ghana broadcasting corporation we are asking for local defense committees at all levels of our national life in the towns in the villages, in all our factories, offices, workplaces, and in our barracks. There is an immediate task for these committees, that of defending this revolution and ensuring the exposure of saboteurs. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was the beginning of the Rawlings era in Ghana, in West Africa, in Africa, and the world over. But. Could there have been another reason why Rawlings staged the coup? And why did he think that he needed exposure in the nation's biggest newspaper ahead of staging his coup? Flight Lieutenant Rawlings said to me that, oh, 
uh, he was going to lead the group of soldiers that were going to see off General Akufo at the airport. Because General Akufo, having become chairman of the SMC2, that day he was going to, I think, the Gambia and Senegal. And Fly Lieutenant Rawlings said to me that, oh, he was going to be the officer who was going to lead the guard of honor at the airport. Could I please send, make sure that uh, the graphic cameras capture this? So at the meeting, the graphic, the morning meeting where we send out reporters and such, I declared an interest. I said to my colleagues at the meeting that I have an interest. There's a friend of mine who is going to lead the detachment that will see of um, the guard of honor for General Kufo. That can the cameraman who is going please make sure that they take a photo of him. He's called Fly Lieutenant Rollins. And everybody laughed. And we put this picture of Fly Lieutenant Rollins leading the guard of honor detachment on the front page of the graphic. A few days later, Fly Lieutenant Rollins stages or attempts to stage a coup May 15th. This is a few days later. So that day, as it happened, the graphic was the only person that had a photo of the person who had tried to stage the coup. And why did we have a photo? Because we had photographed him leading this detachment at the airport. That's, that's the only reason we had the photo of him. Nevertheless, the corresponding coup from his release on June 4, 1979, produced the AFRC, the Armed Forces Revolutionary Council. And the most memorable product of the AFRC was the executions of high-ranking military officers. Truly, the youth of Ghana called for the blood to flow, and so the blood was shed at Champong. Yutuka, Feli, Amedome, Akufu, Yabwachi, they all died. But surely, even if the youth was calling for the blood to flow, that should not include one man, Okatechie Amankwa Efrifa. He had left both the army and government 10 years earlier. He had run for elections and had been elected as member of parliament for the Mampong constituency. He was minding his own business. JJ was blamed for this but in his last public interview before jj passed he told the real story to famous journalist kweku sechiado if it wasn't for this general mm. afrifa would not have been on the list no no, no. and so afrifa's name on the list was not your preference no i don't think no when we compiled the list none of us had him in mind i told you what had happened it wasn't too well you know, I had him detained and I sent to the hospital. When he recovered, I told Dennis to send him home. You know, I was not part of it. But when you hold such a general in awe, and you're just a young officer, you know, thrust into a situation like this, and people have to go, you know, and he tells you something like this, he would know. Yeah. Um, do you it, it's not illogical. Right. Do you regret it? No comments yet. The AFRC handed over power to the winners of the elections. The winners were the PNP. The PNP had been warned by Rawlings that he would be watching their every move as a new government. Somehow, they forgot the warning. And less than a year or so into the government, author Kevin Shillington reports that Ni Odoi Sykes, leader of the opposition in parliament, accused the PMP functionaries of amassing wealth for themselves and their apparatchiks through the much corrupted imports license regime. During the second anniversary of the regime, the leader and president, Dr. Lehman, prophesied as follows. He said, and I quote, Unless we change our old ways, we shall fail to achieve our objectives and we may end up in a national disaster again. 
And yes, on 31st December 1981, Lehman's fears were reached. The national disaster had occurred. Flights Lieutenant Rawlings has struck again in a successful coup, making JJ one of the most successful coup makers on the continent of Africa. He had succeeded with at least two major coups in two and a half years. This time, like the first time, JJ was welcomed by the people. An agenda to govern was designed in the form of the PNDC. It was called the Provisional National Defense Council. JJ hit the ground running. He worked with the people. He worked for the people. He carried cocoa sacks and he educated the people. We have no property, but at least we can stand our ground with dignity. When you decide to insult that dignity, that one you're asking for trouble. Sometimes these politicians can come and steal from you. They will do you in, but at the end of the day, they'll come and sit with you and drink small pito or come and eat small kenke with you. The fact that he's big man, he's doing this with you, you seem to overlook some of his faults because he's not treating you with contempt. Because he is not treating you with contempt. And yes, he ruled the people. Without you, it would not have been possible. And don't forget, you are the true heroes of this situation. And don't let us down, don't let the masses down. You understand? Take another look at yourself. Put in the very best of yourself. You understand? Put in the very best of yourself. Unlike the AFRC, the PNDC had a heavy civilian presence, including even women. JJ led from both the front and the back. The PNDC encountered some difficulties. Economic hardships and international sanctions against Ghana made life somewhat difficult. Credit to JJ that he put together a formidable team of old politicians and new brilliant young men and women. Some of them senior members of the University of Ghana. Justice D.F. Annan, the old Court of Appeal judge, was the notable stabilizer of the group. P.V. Obeng, an engineer from KNUST, was thought to be the Prime Minister. He was called the Chairman of the Committee of Secretaries. Yes, that's how they called ministers, secretaries. Kwesi Boche was reassuring as Minister of Finance, and Obeda Samoa was the quintessential politician and lawyer. The list of key actors under the PNDC would always be incomplete without the mention of Nana Kunedu Ajeman Rawlings. She wasn't a Secretary of State, but she constructed an edifice using the context of probity and accountability. She used a lot of women to achieve many objectives. She was largely successful. Within a few years, the 31st December Women's Movement had become a power block in the country. The PNDC rule became scary at some point. People were going missing and they passed the habeas corpus amendment law, PNDC law 91, which provided expressly that in all cases of detention, the high court shall not have power to inquire into the detentions. That was scary. People could now be detained and killed without any recourse to justice. That was scary. And it was implemented. One night in June 1983, three judges and a retired army officer were gruesomely murdered just outside Accra. That was a cardinal sin against the conscience of the nation. Everyone was angry, but everyone was also afraid. Many people, including professionals, left the country. Everyone was unnerved. And when the PNDC people were asked, but why are things so bad in Ghana? They responded with a song. Why is it so? Why is it so? We are the producers of why is it so? Why is it so? Why is it so? We are the producers of why is it so? Come on! Hey! Come on! Hey! Revolution! I'm a better! Revolution! I'm a better! Let's get your dirt! Let's get your dirt! I see my toilet! People in Ghana were tired and frustrated about the murder of the judges. Pressure was brought to mount on the PNDC. A trial was occasioned 
and a leading Kada, Joachim Amatekwe, was executed by firing squad for his role in the murder. The chief of defense staff resigned. Some Kedas were not happy that one of their own had been killed. Once again, they made a song about it. Revo, revo, revolution has a long way to go, but has come to stay. Revo, revo, revolution has a long way to go, but has come to stay. Kegas may go, Kegas may come, but the revolution has come to stay. Revo, revo, revolution has a long way to go, but has come to stay. Kegas may go, Kegas may come, but the revolution has come to stay. Revo, revo, revolution has a long way to go, but has come to stay. Meanwhile, the PNDC had received over 1 million Ghanaians who had been deported from neighboring Nigeria. J.J. Rawlins was a hero again. His popularity returned. Patriotism in Ghana was growing. The economy began to recover in 1985 and in 1986. Things were slowly building up again. Rumors of counter coups and coups had completely reduced and the curfew had been lifted. The PNDC was going to wind down as a government with a good record in the economy. The cracks in the PNDC, however, began when constitutional rule was about to start. They were divided on what to do and what not to do. Some of them didn't even want constitutional rule. They wanted the PNDC to continue, and others wanted J.J. Rawlings to step aside. J.J. won two elections in 1992 and in 1996. In 2000, J.J. handed over power to the MPP. J.J. did not have an excellent relationship with John Ajekum Kofor, the new president. It so deteriorated that J.A. Kofor was compelled to remove all diplomatic courtesies accorded J.J. Rawlings as former president. J.J. campaigned ferociously against Kofor in the 2004 election. J.A. Kofor, however, won that election. Jerry John Rawlings campaigned against the MPP again in 2008. This time, the NDC won on a second round. Professor Mills became the president. J.J. Rawlings, again, was critical of Professor Mills' leadership. One thing that J.J. wanted done by Mills was the prosecution of people that J.J. believed were responsible for the murder of the Yana. Until recently, that matter was a sorry spot in the chieftaincy history of Ghana. Professor Mills died in office and John Dramani Mahama became the president. JJ seemed critical of John Mahama as well. And in 2016, it was widely reported that JJ had said that he did not even cast his vote for the candidate of his own party. Since 2017, JJ Rawlings seems to have had a better relationship with Akufuado than his own party. He has taken opportunity time and again to eulogize the president, Nana Akufuado. He has called him a man of integrity. We are very fortunate also that somebody like Nana Akufuado has emerged over here. People think I like that man to high heavens. No. But I respect him for certain principles, certain values. And I just keep, I will continue to pray and I, I sincerely hope that he stays the track. He seemed to like him as a leader and some people believe that J.J. Rawlings' liking of Akufuado is partly because Akufuado has been able to resolve that intractable Yana crisis by installing a new Yana for the people of Yendi. Meanwhile, Nana Kunedu Ajiman Rawlings has left the NDC and formed her own party called the NDP. JJ's last public statement of political consequence was his reply to Professor Kwame Nahoy's controversial book. Flight's Lieutenant Rawlings was unhappy and promised to respond in full in good time. 
Alas, that was not to be. JJ's last public appearance was at the death of his 101-year-old mom, Victoria. Many people have made observations about JJ Rawlings and his life. He was charismatic. Yes, he was. He had the magnet. He was a successful politician and a great Air Force pilot. JJ Rawlings also seemed to be a great father and a great family man to his family. He had been a successful mentor to his own daughter, who is now a member of parliament. But why did JJ Rawlings seem to fall out with so many of his comrades that in the end, he seemed to have lost his friendship with all his comrades from the beginning through to the middle and up to the end? Name them, Bwachi Jan, most of the AFRC members, Elizabeth Ohini, Zara Yebo, Akatapori, Yao Graham, Kwesi Boche, PV Obin, most of the PNDC members, Obeda Samoa himself, really, almost all JJ's colleagues, except Mr. Martin Amidu, now the former special prosecutor, had lost friendship with Flight Lieutenant Rawlings. Maybe, just maybe, JJ's standards of integrity was too high for many. Maybe he couldn't get along with people for too long. We don't know. What we do know is that so colossal was JJ's impact that even at 73, we will say JJ is gone too soon. Now, who will address the cadres on 31st December this year? We were all waiting to hear what JJ will say about the outcome of the December 7th elections. Alas, we won't know. And who will address the next June 4th celebration? We don't know. JJ has certainly gone too soon. But he made such a tremendous impact. Rest in peace, Flight Lieutenant Rawlings, Demri Fadri.